We're taking a look at the Trinity, the Godhead, the three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are three distinct beings, but yet they are so united that they become one being. Not three separate gods, but one God, but three parts to the God, which is a mystery we don't understand, but yet we accept it by faith because we cannot grasp the extent of God and the intricacy of God. And so we take what we don't understand by faith, but we delve into the mystery of understanding God and who he is. Probably the easiest part of God to understand is what we'll look at today, which is the Son of God. The Son of God that we know is the name Jesus. Jesus is like the door that enters that we enter in order to get a relationship with God, because we understand God the best by taking a look at Jesus and relating to him. The Son of God has always existed, but the Son of God entered the human race through a baby, which we call Jesus. Now the Son of God is now the Son of Man, God and man, who we call Jesus Christ. Jesus' name means God our Savior. And Christ, which is not a last name or a middle name, but it's a Greek word that means the Messiah, which actually means the anointed one. So literally, when we talk about Jesus Christ, we're saying God is our Savior, the anointed one. He was chosen. He was chosen as God and by God to take part in a very special service in order to be able to reunite man with God, to be able to be the door which people enter into in order to have that relationship with God. Why did the Son of God come to earth to do this? Certainly because of his love for man, even sinful men. But the Son was also obedient to the Father's will. It was the Father's plan, a perfect plan, so that there would be a perfect unity between God and mankind, just as there's a perfect unity amongst God, the different parts of the Godhead. If God could become the ultimate sacrifice, then sin could be forgiven once and for all. And maybe there was a different way that it could have been taken care of, but this seemed like the most perfect way for God himself, and in this part, the Son of God, in order to come to earth to take on the form of a man but yet a perfect man in order to accomplish the sacrifice that would be perfectly accepted on our behalf. We read about this in the most best way possible. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Let's read this. It's talking about Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very form of a servant and being made in human likeness and found the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what's so ironic about the relationship within the Godhead. Here the Son humbles himself in order to be able to glorify the Father. And as a result of what the Son did, the Father gives the glory back to his Son and even gives him more of it than what he received himself. It's a glory that's everlasting. And we still have it today. The glory of the Godhead shines brightest through Jesus Christ. Because God himself, the Father, has said, This is my Son that we know as Jesus. And he wants him to receive an even greater amount of devotion and recognition. Of course, we all love to be able to brag about our children, about our grandchildren. We love to be able to show them off. We love to be able to be proud of the things that they've accomplished and the type of people they've become. And in, that is a reflection of who God is.
because even God the Father is proud of his son and wants to show him off to the world and says, hey, look at this. Look at God. Look at my son. Hebrews 1.8, we are told about the son. It says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. And we have this king, Jesus, who's on the throne. He's been exalted to the highest place. That Even the father has taken the son and said, you will be made king. You are the one that's ahead of this kingdom that consists of all these people upon the earth who have turned to Jesus for their salvation. And so we have a king that's there, Jesus Christ, the son of God, but he also acts as an one who intercedes for us. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, we're told there is one God and there's one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. And in this verse, we see that mystery of the Godhead again. We see that there's one God, even though there's three, but yet even amongst God, there is one mediator. There's one go-between between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. So for us to be able to connect with the rest of the Godhead, it means that we have to be able to connect with the Father and the Spirit and even the Son through the Son. He's the door. He is the way to be able to get into that relationship with God. So here we have the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the Father, who's ruling and reigning along with the Father as an heir of everything that was already his in the first place. But it's been added to it because now there's a spiritual kingdom in which Jesus is able to rule over. And so we look to him as our king. We are subjects of his kingdom. And he is actively involved in leading us. And as we submit to him, we're able to work according to be a part of the plan of the ages. The plan that began with the Son of God coming to redeem man and finishing with us being a part of that. And reaching out and giving the glory back to God through our lives as well. Just as the Son did for his Father. When we see ourselves as subjects of the kingdom... It doesn't mean that we can just live as we want because there are certain expectations and responsibilities and privileges that come with being a part of that kingdom. 1 John 5.20 says, We know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. As we strengthen our relationship with Jesus Christ, then we strengthen ourselves in the relationship with the whole Godhead. Because as we are in the Son of God, then we become part of the part of living within the, the relationship with the Father. And in with that comes a relationship with the Holy Spirit, which we're going to learn more about next week. Jesus is the door into the relationship, and as we'll see next week, the Holy Spirit's the bridge, the one that helps us to be able to cross um, the great divide that helps us to be able to grow and be on a journey that leads us to our heavenly kingdom that we will get to someday. But in the meantime, when we find ourselves in Christ, that faith transforms our character and makes us more Christ-like. When we look at Jesus and what, how he lived and what he taught, and we take those things to heart and begin to live them out ourselves, then we find ourselves being transformed even more and more into his image. The goal of our faith is not just to get us to heaven, but so that we can live like him and be his representatives, be his subjects of his kingdom here on earth. And the more we get to know God through knowing Jesus, the more we're going to be like him in a way that we think and we speak and we act. There's a lot of people who really like that God can be our Savior. We really like that Jesus did all the things that were necessary for us to be able to get salvation. But when we're told that if we find ourselves in him, then we are going to live as Jesus lived. That's a pretty high requirement to be able to live the way that Jesus lived. And we can't just take that as an optional, well, I'll do it or I won't do it. Every day we have to decide, am I going to live 
in representation of Jesus Christ my Savior today or not. We are hungry, we are thirsty, and nothing else will satisfy us except Jesus Christ. He is the door into that relationship with the Godhead. As Jesus himself said in John 6.35, he says, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. For our spiritual hunger, our hunger and our spiritual thirst, Jesus is the only thing that can satisfy. We've ran around before and people have run around before looking for things to fill that thirst and fill that hunger. But nothing does except for Jesus. And as we come to this table today, we're reminded that this little cup of juice and this little tiny piece of bread is not going to fill up our stomachs. And it's not going to totally quench our thirst. But it's a symbol that reminds us that there's one who can. And that is Jesus himself. And so I ask ourselves today, have you entered into that relationship with him? Have you been able to look to him as your savior? Look to him as not just a savior that gets you to heaven, but a savior that walks with you every day of your life and is a role model and teaches us how to be able to live. Let's strengthen that friendship that we have with Jesus Christ. Let's give him the glory as our king. Let's be subject to him in all humility and let him lead as the son of God.